Welcome to Barber Jabber number six with me, Gary Spencer. Today I'll be talking to an international educator, Baldy. He's a great guy. He's been in the industry over 30 years. He's got a fantastic story to tell. I want to find out what has got into the top, what keeps him motivated, and what inspires him. Hope you enjoy the conversation. Hello, welcome to Barber Jabber with me, Gary Spencer, the creator of the Great British Barber. I don't know why I do that. Um, Baldy, how are you today? Yeah, I'm really well. I'm good now. I've got a computer. <laughs> yeah, you're looking, you're looking very athletic. You look half the man you used to look. You're looking well. I'm doing all right. I'm exercising. I put weight on, to be fair. I'm about really? 16 stone. And where it is? It's the old gun show, mate, isn't it? Yeah, no. Doing all right. Brilliant. Well, listen, what I want to talk to you about today, obviously, you've you've had a good career in Barbie the last 20 odd years. Um, but most importantly, and the main thing we're going to discuss is how you got the job working for Andis, because that's a pretty special job. You know, what does that job entail? And also, maybe we can give some advice to people who in the future want to work for a big company like that. But take us back to the start. Take us back to 1962 when you were 25. When did you, you know start? What? It's not far off. <laughs> how long have you been in the industry and how did it all start for you? So I've uh, been in the industry 35 years now, I reckon. 35, 36 years. I don't know. Time flies, doesn't it? I'm old. Um, so I started off when I was, I want to say 14. I was offered a job in a hairdresser's close to where I lived. Um, so I did Wednesday night, Friday night, uh, and all day Saturday, um, in between being a scallywag. And then when I finished school, um, I got an apprenticeship with a different shop, um, did my five years with a guy called Donato Pacelli, uh, an Italian guy who took me under his wing, taught me everything I needed to know. Um, I look, weirdly, I still, every so often I'll see him, um, and I still thank him literally for everything that he, he gave me because without him, I wouldn't be where I am. So I think it's important that, you know, you, you don't burn bridges and that you, you acknowledge the people that got you really started and, and where they got you. So I did that. Then I did freelance for a couple of years, um, uh, did all right. And then... Uh, went to manage a shop and then took it over within a year, I suppose. Um, ended up in a partnership with the owner of the building. Um, and then I was, how old was I then? 23, I think. So I was young then uh, to go into my first business. And then just built up from there. Um, moved shops, lost the, part, the business partner. Um, expanded, was in that shop for 15 years, bought another shop while I was in that one, so that gave me the second shop. Then we switched shops because the lease and rents were getting high, so we're now in a different shop, and we have the ROM room downstairs from that, but we still have the other existing shop that we bought. So yeah, it's, it's spanned out a long time. I've been in business 28 years. Yeah, well, I think that's straight away important what you said about gratitude and, and the appreciation of, of um, the people who maybe get you to where you are. All have a little part in. I still see my boss from 1986 to 89 or whatever, a guy called Tony Marriott, who had he had about 13 hair salons in Southport and Liverpool, okay. this big training organization. But he was definitely somebody who helped me along the way and um, somebody who I sort of aspired to be as a got more into the industry, which would be advice that you would give to young people sometimes in the industry? What are the, what are the key elements they need to have? Do, do you know what uh, the weird thing is as well, just before we go on to that, is that I still cut my basic layers how he taught me. All right? So I, I, and I still teach the same way. So, um, you know, once, once you're taught a, a basic structure, then, you know, you learn other stuff around it. But the foundation, the, so to speak. That's the foundation, you know. Um, so, yeah, for anyone that's, that's coming into the business, 
Uh, firstly, always stay as nice and as true to yourself, okay, and other people. Treat people how you want to be treated, firstly, and you'll find the people that are decent within the industry will help you. Um, a lot of the time, they'll give you advice for free. Um, and, you know, just always remember where you come from and the people that helped you get to where you are. It's, it's a, a career for life, you know. Without this career, I wouldn't have, you know, the house that I've had, the cars, you know, my family wouldn't have been looked after the way they've been looked after. Uh, and I think it's important that you, you recognize that. So anyone coming into it, learn as much as you can to progress, but never forget the people that, that have taught you or helped you or, or got you there. You know, that, would you say that, patience as well? I mean, a lot of people now, we see these guys going on the 10-week course to a, a place in London or a place in Manchester, whatever. Um, yeah. Do you feel that sometimes people can feel that they need to be a great haircutter and as soon as they can do a fade, they think they're the finished article? Would you say yeah. patience is another important issue? You, you are never the finished article. I'm 52 years old. I've been doing this 30-odd years, and I'm still not the finished article. You know, I'm, I'm still learning all the time. I still go to shows, uh, sit in on classes, watch, ask questions, everything. It, it, it's a long-term thing. It's a long game. And I think for these short courses, they may give you a, a basic, like a starting point. Um, and um, I've employed people over the years that have come from certain places in London. Yes. Um, and and I've gone, well, that's great. You've got a, a basic to start with, but we'll take you on as an apprentice, you know, and we'll finish you and complete you over the next year yeah. or so, you know. Um, and some people are okay with that. Um, and other people want to run before they can walk. You know, Definitely. I think what yeah. that's explained is, is to a lot of people is that, and it comes down to money a lot of the time. And, mm. and, and I'll, I don't want to say greed, but back in my day, you know, we worked for 25 quid a week, right? We were yeah. the lowest paid people around. Um, and I, I, you know, I've spoken to you in the past about it. Um, and we had friends, right, that worked in warehouses and places like that. And they were on like a couple of hundred quid a week then. And I was on 25 quid. You know, same for you, Gary, you know, back in the day. So, you know, I'd go down the pub, spend a couple of quid a night. They'd go down the pub, spend 20 quid a night. You know, yeah. um, great. But my, it's, it, I built up as I went, you know. And I think for a lot of people, they expect to go on a course, do 10 weeks or whatever, come out and earn top dollar. And it's not about that. It's about the learning and, and perfecting your craft. And the money will come eventually. They will come eventually. You know, people expect to earn rock and roll star money these days. Um, and it's not the case. And maybe the coronavirus has now shown them that and shook them up a little bit, I hope. Um, because the amount of inquiries I get where people go, oh, I'd love to come and work for you. And I go, okay, well, you know, all my staff are employed. They're paid this amount and they go nah, i can't really afford to come to you oh and then go elsewhere where yeah. they're not going to look up to you not going to teach you the best way um and, and good luck with your future you know yeah Weird. definitely definitely so when so going on to when you started your first shop you i think you said you'd had three and the yeah. first came back you went into a partnership and eventually bought him out what have been yeah. the sort of pitfalls and the, the great times of having those three shops do you, do you know what? A partnership is great, and it and it might help you get going. Um, but inevitably, at the end of it, you are going to fall out, right? There's very few partners that stay friends. Um, partnership is a sinking ship, most people say, don't they? And, and to, for me, I, I would never take on another business partner. Or if I did, I would be the silent partner. Um, yeah. and, and I would do it that way. Because it, it, it is really hard. And I think maybe for someone like me, I'm quite chilled out and easygoing to a degree. So if I was to set, say, one of my team up in a, in a shop of their own, I'd be quite happy to sit back 
and just give them a little wimp, bit of input now and again to help them. Um, but that's that's I'm not fussed, you know. But a lot of partnerships, you're not delivering, and at some point when they want out, oh my god, what that boils down to. And I learned it can be it can be a sticky one, can't it? Yeah, my business partner. Bear in mind, I was young. My business partner was an older guy, um, and he proper tried to turn me over uh, for for money. Um, little did he know really my whole background and that I'm not easily swayed or turned over. Um, so, uh, but it, you know, it, I got issued with high court writs and all sorts of things. Um, and it was only through you know me being me and, and getting out of it. Uh, that I managed to walk away and start again, but yeah. I would never. I would. It's hard, you know, but it is a starting point for some people. Yeah, definitely. I've been there myself, to be honest. And yeah. it's always ended in tears. But um, you know, we've all got a story to tell, haven't we? You know, you all start off with the best intentions, and and someone offers. You're both going to work really hard, and you're both going to put 110 percent in, and then you find out the other guy's on the golf course, or he's in. I don't know, right. Beater all the time, or I've, yeah, very hard to both put the same amount in, isn't it? You know, yeah, I've got tucked up badly financially. Um, I got hit with a huge tax bill at the end of a, like a, a three, four year period where I was signing uh, my tax returns, he was dealing with it and not paying any tax. Oh. <laughs> Yeah. And then when the tax man come to me with this huge bill, I was like, what are you on about? I've got no money. Yeah, you thought it sorted. <laughs> so moving forward, you now you've got your two shops now. Tell me a little yeah. bit about where it is now with the business and how that's going and the team you've got working okay. with you. So um, we have one shop in the town centre in Aylesbury in Buckinghamshire, um, which is where I've always been in the town centre. So that's if you like. Although the premises has changed a few times, that's really our flagship uh, shop um, because that's where our reputation was built in that, that town. So, and then the second shop is about 10 minutes just outside. Uh, and we bought that as an overspill, um, which worked really well. Now, I mean, I mean, I say as an overspill, I've had it 12 years now. Um, and it's, it's now got its own client base. It, it does really well on its own merits, you know. Um, it's associated, it has the same name, uh, has the same look. Um, it's, it's a bigger square of shop, but it's on a housing estate. Um, but it, you know, it, it does fine. And then the main shop we have upstairs is walking service. Downstairs, uh, once a week, I have the rum room and I do an executive um, appointment service. Um, but that, that's just me. So, yeah, the, the shops do really well. They're both very urban looking, uh, bikes on the ceiling, on the walls, um, you know, motorbikes in and all sorts of things. Um, so they're, they're good. They're cool shops. Ice wise, what, what type of price do you charge for your place for, for a cut? And, and also, do you work on appointments or is it just walking? So, this is a really weird thing, right? So, um, people know me because a lot of the time because of my profile and Andis and, and stuff like that. So they expect that I would be charging, I don't know, top top dollar. Um, well, where I am, our, our haircuts are like 15, 16 quid on a walk-in yeah. service, right? I don't charge 25, 30 quid just because I'm me. My customers don't care who I am. They just know I'm a barber in Aylesbury. Um, that's it. So, you know, and, and that's where my bread and butter is, is servicing those people, those clients that have been with me, you know, through thick and thin and, and making sure they're okay. So we only charge uh, within the market price. We're not the most expensive. I'm not the cheapest, you know. Uh, we're in the higher end. But that's only, like I say, it's 15 quid for a normal cut, 16 quid for a skin fade. Um, on the, and that's on a walk-in basis. Downstairs in the rum room, I have the executive service, which is book online. So it's appointment only. It's a membership. You have to be a member. So you pay uh, £10 a year membership. Um, and that keeps it exclusive, if you like. Uh, so for me, I get to do the people that I want to do. Um, so I can deny uh, someone a membership and go, 
So it's not for you. Um, <laughs> it's lovely, isn't it? So, um, but that's 25 quid a cup. And they get an hour appointment. They get a bit of pampering. They get to have a drink or whatever they want to do. You know, whether that be water, tea, coffee or rum, you know. Uh, Brilliant. Rum. So, yeah. Super. So fast forwarding from the business, one thing we get asked all the time is, how do you get an ambassadorship? You know, people always want to be an ambassador. I personally say to them, you know, you've got to love the product first of all. Yeah, I think that's key that not just to take on any kind of thing that gets offered you, because there's loads of things that do fly around. But what you, you know, how did you get that first foot in the door with the Andis job? So um, it's a long story. Are you ready for a long story? Yeah, and I'm, and that's what we're here for, mate. Yeah, so... Uh, do you remember, you, you'll remember, so you remember New World Barbers? Yes, yeah, big, that was a big thing, a big, a, like a coming together of quite a few guys, wasn't it, in the barber yeah. industry, prolific guys? So, um, it started off back then, which was maybe seven years ago, eight years ago, maybe, just before the, the boom, as it was starting to grow, um, and there was a group of us that all chatted on Twitter, there was myself, Kieran, uh, who else? Alan Beak, Mozambique, um, you know, people like that. There was uh, Declan, there was... Uh, Greg McElane was in there. Uh... Yeah, well, no, he wasn't originally. Um, right. So originally, there was probably only... Uh, there was like John from Barbertown um, and Tom Trapp um, from Kingpin. So there was a, a, a group of us. But what we wanted to do was... Um, initially, because we were all, you know, starting to get recognised, if you like, on social media, um, we wanted to do something together. So the idea was that, like back then, you had the Bomb Squad. Uh, I think they would have just started. Um, I don't think the Young Feds weren't even a thing then. They were just maybe the following year. So New World Barbers took off. It, it was a massive thing because it was like one of the first... I say repost sites, but it was a repost site for us and our work. So um, anyway, I started speaking to Rachel from Modern Barber. Didn't know her at the time. Uh, didn't even know she was a woman because uh, it, it was just Modern Barber. So I would have a bit yeah. of banter back and forth and, and, and what have you on Twitter. And then I spoke to her. Um, I messaged her and said, look, have you heard of New World Barbers? And she said, yeah. I said, well, you know, it's a really good team of barbers, but we want to do some work together. Mm. And she, she sort of said to me, and I was probably naive back then, because I was like, do you, want to, do you want to book us for a photo shoot? And she's like, um, I don't have that sort of budget. What are you on about? <laughs> and I was like, all oh, right. <laughs> so she said, look, let me act as a, the middle person, and I'll try and farm it out, see if anyone's interested. Uh, and then about, what's been a good six, seven months later, that's what I mean. These things aren't always easy or straightforward. They take a lot of work in the background. Um, she come back and said, Andis were looking for um, someone to relaunch in the UK. Uh, they yeah. wanted to put a new video together, a photo shoot and stuff like that. Would we be interested in doing it? So we had to cut it down to sort of six of us, I think. The six that felt comfortable doing it. So uh, there was me... Alan, John, Greg, because Greg was in it by then, uh, Kieran, and Danielle that works for Alan, um, right. because we needed a girl. There wasn't very many girls then, um, not on the scene, if you like. Um, and so he said, look, I've got, I've got a girl that works for me. She's really good. And we were like, okay, we'll use her. So um, we did this photo shoot. Um, live video stuff and all that. And, and the weird thing is, I, like, I can talk to Alan now um, and, and look back, and we had to do uh, video interviews, right? And right. I'd say a little bit about the Clipper and, and this and the other. Now, Alan is a fantastic presenter now, right? And he's so natural, he's so fluent, you know, he, his knowledge is fantastic. And, and he's got such a lovable personality as, as well as being really talented. He, 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 he makes everybody feel welcome, doesn't he? Yeah. yeah. If you ask Alan about his first video, right, and he had to do this presentation on film 
oh my god he couldn't get his words out for love nor money and yeah yeah, yeah. That, that about 10 takes he was like and imagine me there i'm like this i'm just ripping it out of him constantly so um but that's how far we've all moved on so that was i don't know six years ago so they sent us care yeah. packages we got used to using the clippers and, and exploring you know the brand um and I, I got offered a job off the back of that or a few of us did and i said no initially um and they were like what do you mean no and i was like well, i'm a bit busy and i i've got like a couple of shots and that and, you know a lot of stuff and I don't think I've got time. Yeah. And Why do we need Kieran it? Worked. Yeah, Kieran worked for me at the time. And I said, he's all right. He can come back down for an interview if you want. I'll give him a day off. Um, anyway, Eileen Nunes, the, that was the education manager then, said, well, all right, let's hold on then. We're coming back over in the May. This was in February time. She goes, would you do a show for us? So we were like, yeah, okay. So we went and did uh, Barbie UK. Um, at the NEC, um, we did um, the we did a main class in the um, the boxing rings, you know the BBA rings. Yeah. And when we get up there, this was like on entrance, so it's about ten thirty in the morning. No, quiet is first thing in the morning when everyone's just coming into shows. So anyway, Kieran gets on the microphone and he starts giving it. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and all this, and all of a sudden, boom, there's about 200 people there. Um, they came from everywhere because it was so quiet in there to start with. They were like, what, what's that? What's going on? So they literally came to this boxing ring, and we we just gave them what they were looking for. You know, we're quite boisterous. We're quite entertaining. You know, we like to have a bit of fun as well as do our education. And... Um, absolutely smashed it and then when came off of there and they went how do you fancy come to America we were like yay and by that time I'd gone you know what that was great I want to do this so um, that's how it started and then we got fantastic and and so obviously you got big into it where is it taking you I mean you've been I've seen you in America at shows and all over the place taken me all over the world it's been fantastic really for me i i would never have dreamt going back seven years ago that i could sit there as a barber and go do you know what i i'm i'm signed to a couple of companies and they send me all over the world to places i would never have dreamt of going um you know it a few of us in the beginning were went over <laughs> obviously we broke into russia uh in the sense of before a lot of people have, have ever been so we were the first ones to go i've been going to russia for like five years or something like that you know some of them only been going the last couple of years but when i got asked to go there i was like what they were like yeah would, would you go and do a job in russia and i was like uh everyone else said no didn't they i was like and then you was like we know who will go, who will go. <laughs> so i ended up going to russia um and it's been absolutely fantastic. I go back a few times a year um, to you know various companies, but America, I've been all over, done shows out there. I've done IBS, ABS, New York, Chicago. I've done uh, CT Expo, um, all sorts of things. And I've been all over Russia. I've done more of Russia than what Russians have. Um, yeah. I did one job. I did. We did ten flights in eight days um, because we always go on a tour. So we do like city to city. So I'll do like nine days out there, ten days out there. Um, literally fly in, fly out, fly in, fly out, fly in, fly out. Um, and so there's that. I've done India. I've done Thailand, Malaysia. Uh, I was meant to go Australia this. Well, I meant to be going Australia the last couple of years, but for whatever reason, trips get keep getting cancelled. This year, I was meant to go fly up to the expo, the Australian expo, and then fly straight back in the day before Barber Connect. So yeah. um, I do weird trips like that where I, I can fly around, fly straight back in, and go straight to a show here. Um, it's hard work. And for anyone wanting to be an ambassador or get into this sort of lifestyle, it's, it's not for everyone. Um, I listened to um, 
my boss, my big boss, Matt Andis, um, talking about it the other day. And he said, he po- what he pointed out was there's millions of people out there that would maybe make good ambassadors because they're really good at their work, you know, their, their work's crisp, clean, fantastic at what they do. But are they disciplined enough to self-manage? Because you're on the road a long time by yourself a lot of the time. You know, if someone goes to you, right, uh, Gary, I need you to go to Mongolia next week uh, for, yeah. for two days, right? Um, and is, you've got a credit card. Uh, take a credit card, sort out your hotel, uh, and let us know when the job's finished. Right? That's it. So you go, you deliver your education format um, to what they, they specify, entertain the people, fly back home. You know, that's not for everyone. Not everyone can do that. Um, and entertain people. You know, you, you have to be able to do that side of it as well. You know, you know yourself, right, from when I've come down and done, done your shows, and we spoke about it in the past, that I found it really hard doing, doing a stint on your stage because you compare the whole thing. You bring everyone together. Yes. Yeah. Right? Which, which you're really good at, and you, you enjoy doing, I'm guessing. Yeah. But you'll know the difference between you'll get set people on your stage that can talk, set people that can't. Um, and so for me, and even the rest of my Andis team, whenever we do stints for you, we find it a little bit strange. Yeah. Because yeah. we're talking less. Um, yes. And just cutting air. So for us, it, it, it's a bit weird, but you make it comfortable for the people that can't do that. You yes, know, can't talk as much. Them chance, gives them a break, you know. Gives them a chance to be up on a on a nice stage, um, and show what what they're about. But it, it's really strange because people are, people are, are on your shows again a lot better now. Like Ollie has come on in leaps and bounds. When when I first saw Ollie, he was quiet. You know, he was just getting to grips with it. Could cut air, but didn't really deliver on on the education side. Now look at him. He he does you credit. He's you know yeah, he's, he's brilliant. He's he's your your forerunner if you like, and and everyone looks to. Him. And you listen to him now. He's so uh, clear on his message and everything that he delivers. Absolutely brilliant. Hayden yeah. Hayden cut her teeth with you. Um, now look at her. You know you can't. Yeah, I mean, she's flying. Yeah, and and she's probably one of the busiest educators in the world. Um, you know, she's here. Mr. There. Beak, Mr. Alan Beak, he obviously, yeah. well, he was always going to be successful. We did a lot of stuff with him uh, in our first shows. Yeah. Mozambique, yeah. his brother as well. Yeah. So when he was working for us with Andis, which not everyone knows because it was a long time ago, but, you know, Alan worked for Andis initially in the beginning with me. Um, and he, he was doing a lot of your stuff, a lot of your education. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's everyone has to start somewhere, but you, you have to grow as a person and develop what you can do and what you can't. It's definitely not for everybody, is it? I mean, I definitely think that people who can cut her, it's no yardstick as to whether they can be an educator. Because again, we've we've had great hair cutters come along and want to go on stage, and it just doesn't suit their character. A lot of the great hair cutters are quite quiet, some are quite quiet, you know. Yeah. On that, what would you say then to what would be your advice then? So somebody wants to um, go on the stage, what would you say were the three main ingredients? Right. So um firstly, obviously you've got to be able to cut air really well. And you've got to be able to take criticism. Mm. Because if you're prepared to stand up there in front of hundreds of people, you know, whether it be four people or four thousand people. <laughs> someone's going to knock you somewhere. You know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. And you've got to be able to wear that and take it on the gym. So, mm. firstly, your work has to be outstanding. Secondly, you have to be able to take that little bit of criticism. But you have to have a massive outgoing personality and, and but be humble at the same time. You know, you have to be able to listen to people. You have to be able to take it on board. And you have to be able to then deliver it. Um, and and it, like I say, it's for someone starting in the beginning, I think, um, I, I'll give you a prime example, is my, my son, Liam. 
right? So, yeah, great, great guy. We love him. We'll know him as the Liam Kenny. So, we started Liam cutting air at 13 years age, right? He was 13. Mm-hmm. He, he was bored being a Saturday boy sweeping up. He went, teach me something. Okay. So, I spent the summer uh, teaching him to cut hair on the block. He then, um, I, I got to that point where I was like, well, I'm stuck with him now. What do I do? You know, he's, he's just a kid. He's 14 years old. I've got to put him on the shop floor because what else am I going to That's the stage he's at. Yeah. So at 14, he was he was on the shop floor on a Saturday, working at, like, at school during the week on the shop floor on a on a Saturday. And he he's just really talented. So he then went away on courses by himself, right? This is this will give you an insight to how people or what people need to know and, and the examples that they need to follow. So at 14, 15 years old, he went to Nottingham up to Sid's Academy, uh, did a week's course with Sid on his scissor work um, and stuff like that, did a shaving course. He was a 14 year old boy, stayed by himself in a hotel. Um, Sid would go and pick him up in the morning and drop him off, but. And then I'd ring the hotel, check with the hotel staff that he was okay and stuff like that. But that's the sort of thing that he was prepared to do. Then we put him on, uh, he did a presentation course as well with Sid, um, Mm -hmm. how to present. We then put him on the Ambis stage. So he would have been maybe 15, 16, coming up, uh, still Mm -hmm. at school. Absolutely smashed it. Um, And then... He then had to take his exam. So he came off the scene, off the circuit for about a year. No one saw him. And, and I, it was very important to us as a family to make sure that he got his education right and stuff like that. So when he came back, I literally went, right, okay, you've got to start from scratch again a little bit. You've had this, this great career early doors where you're like 14, 15 year old. And he'd done, by that stage, British Master Barbers. He'd done Barber Connect. He'd done uh, Barber UK. He'd done pretty much everything. Um, and then had a year out. So I said to him, well, who did I, who did I contact, Gary? <laughs> Contacted you. So, yeah. Because it's it's a starting point. And, and I think even for you, you didn't have that, that full trust in, in him because he was so young. Oh, I, yeah, definitely. You always doubt it a little bit, yeah. you know. And I had, to, I had to explain and go, look, listen, he's a massive talent and he's he's probably better than, I would say, 75% of the people that you're going to see. And, right. And that was at that age. And then he came to do a show with me, didn't he? Uh, I think Liverpool. Uh, Liverpool, yeah. Yeah, and he was cutting on the floor then. And then when you then, I said to him, I said to you, didn't I, when are you going to get him up on the stage? And you was like, yeah, yeah. yeah, all right, I'll give him a go. I'll get him up on the stage. And then he absolutely, the, the feedback was phenomenal, wasn't it? Yes, it was excellent. He's another one. He's We've taught him to present and talk and break down everything that you do, you know, and be absolutely clear on, on all your education. And, mm. you know, he's he's been doing that, like I say, from early days. And he found it weird, the fact that the other guys weren't talking so much, you know? Yeah. Um, so he's now working alongside Tom Baxter, Ryan Cullen, people like that on your stage. That's right. That's um, it. And people love him, you know? I mean, you're exactly right. The, the thing is with it is it is being a great hair cutter, but when you're on stage for 45 minutes, it's, it's mostly entertainment and talking. And what I always say to everybody, especially somebody new, is let me give you some questions. Let's discuss some questions. Prepare your talking. And most of the time it works, but there's been a couple of times where they just not listen to what I've said. And yes, they're brilliant, brilliant at cutting hair. Yeah. But you get on the stage and it doesn't work. Doesn't work. It's going to happen when you when you have as many people. Yeah, but think, like you're saying, preparation. Ooh. And I think people forget that to address the audience, right? Those, mm. The people are there to come and watch, and and they, they're obviously interested in what you're doing because they're there stood in front of you. You know, otherwise they wouldn't yeah. be there. So engage with them. 
if you don't engage with your audience, they soon get bored and wander off. You know, um, look at me. I, I literally, as soon as you introduce me normally, if I'm on your stage, uh, which I've done, look at the last show, right? I had no tools. I had to borrow a comb, some scissors, and a set of clippers. Yeah. Uh, and, and do a haircut to help you out. And But the first thing I do is I walk straight up to the edge of that stage. I engage with the audience. I introduce mm. myself, give us a little bit of background information for the ones that don't know me, uh, explain what I'm going to be doing. Um, yes. And, and that's an icebreaker. You know, you're talking to yes. them as if they're, they're your mates. Um, and, yeah. and that's a massive, massive thing. It's very important. But not everyone can do it. How do you feel just on this on a similar subject? Because again, another thing people have problems with working internationally with interpreters or um, so I've worked with guys and we said to them, right, um, this lady's gonna be your interpreter today. Like, the chunks of words, mate, just keep it small. And then they've gone out and gone, hi, I'm going to start. They've talked for 10 minutes, and then the interrupter's going. Where do I start? Um, yeah, yeah. Do you have any problems or do you find it quite easy with interpreters? Right. So I've, I've had some really good interpreters. I've, I've had some really bad interpreters. I've had interpreters that have interpreted nothing I've said. Right? Yeah. And, and I can tell straight away that if I say something mm -hmm. and I look at them and wait for them to deliver it and they go, blah, blah, blah. And I go, they didn't say what I said. Um, yeah. and, it, and for me, because... I use a lot of humor to engage with people. Um, I want that to come across. So when I get a really good one, it's absolutely brilliant and it comes across. But other times, I'll go blah, 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 blah. Say exactly what I say. Blah, 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 blah. And then they don't bother. And I'm like, like that. And I think, we well, use rubbish. So I, th I think me and Kieran have like literally sacked interpreters on the road and gone, you're, you're the worst interpreter I've ever had. I'm not using you again. Get me someone else. <laughs> <laughs> and that sounds really prima donna, doesn't it? But it's the most important thing. You've got to get, it's the little nuances. It's the small words, isn't it? They have to know those. And sometimes maybe even it takes a bit of um, going through it all beforehand with an interpreter as well. Yeah. Every show, we'll have a meeting with the interpreter to make sure they're comfortable and that they're comfortable saying things that we would say for a start. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but sometimes you get some that, that come, not so much. So what happens is we'll work for a, although we work for Andis, the distributor firm in that country is the one that takes you on tour and does the stuff for you, right? So I'm yeah. representing Andis for them. Um, so they'll find interpreters wherever they take you, you know, like I've been in the middle of Siberia and, you know, weird places. And you get these interpreters and it's like a 12-year-old boy. Um, but he knows some English. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he knows a bit of English. And it's like that. So, and then other times you get people that are absolutely fantastic and smashed you. You know, yeah, um, really, really well. The hardest thing is when you're traveling with someone that doesn't speak a lot of your language. Uh, yes. And there's just like this silence everywhere you go. It's, it's difficult. Really yeah. That's when you appreciate Netflix or your Spotify. So here's a weird thing. So you pick up certain, like I always make a point of whatever country I'm in, uh, learning certain phrases like hello, um, Thank you, please. All the little things, right? So you always try and, especially the greeting, so that you can greet that audience. Um, yes. And whether you get it right or wrong, they will always see it as endearing. You know what I mean? Because you've tried. So Definitely. But weirdly, it means that people like, so you have uh, Roman come over and, and do stuff for you, don't you? Right, Roman Solo. Yes, yes. Uh, well, Roman's now does stuff around us, right? Um, because I scouted him. So I'd seen Roman out in Russia a few times before I saw him at yours, right? So yeah. I'd always said hello Clip to killer. him. Clipper killer people will know that, yeah. yeah. So I'd, I'd always said hello to Roman and, and I was talking to him on a regular basis. But, you know, and he doesn't speak a lot of English. But I don't, and I don't speak a lot of Russian, but we'd always get a buy, weirdly. You know, we'd, I'd see him Yes, I know what you mean. 
So he, and we were looking for someone, and I was like, I'm putting him forward because he's absolutely awesome at what he does, and he has a whole style of his own. Um, he's fantastic. Definitely. But I would never have met him, you know, uh, unless I went there, and then obviously I see him at your show as well, so I'd already knew him, so I was like, yeah. it made him feel a bit more comfortable. But, yeah, yeah. It's, it's bizarre, isn't it? Yeah. Listen, what I was going to ask you was, you obviously spend a lot of time in America at the shows over there. What is the difference between the American presenters, the American barbers, the way they cut hair and the way they present? Is there a big difference between them and the UK? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there is. Um, so they, they love you if you are full of energy. If if you if you're full of energy and and you're like that when you present, they'll they'll take to you straight away, um, because a lot of their if you like educators uh, and the people that present at shows and stuff like that are very loud, boisterous, fun. If you like, full of energy, they have to have energy. Yeah, um, but showmen may maybe a bit more showmen. Would you say? Yeah, very, very much so. You know, they're they're very comfortable on, on stages, most of them. Um, and they've been doing it a lot longer because they've had a lot of shows out there for a long, long time. Um, yeah. you know, always a lot of them have been very urban. Uh, and I think the first barbecue I ever went to was in New York. And uh, this will make you laugh, right? Because Alan and Kev Lutzman turned up uh, yeah. a bit, and they were in suits. And the whole place was in like this old, old theater. And it was a bit like going to Eight Mile. That's the only way I could describe it. It was like Eight Mile for barbers. But they were playing rap music, and it was like everyone was like this in the crowd. Dun, 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 like that. And you imagine Alan and Kev turned up in suits. Everyone else in snapbacks. Um, Big Joe was on stage, right? With a little yeah. goatee. No, a little goatee. Um, so it's very urban. Um, but they've been doing that circuit for years, like with barber battles and everything. So mm. um, they're used to that side of it. So they are very flamboyant at times and, and, you know, full of energy. Whereas over here, we're a little bit more subdued. So for me, it works when I go out there because I'm, I'm quite loud, you know. And yeah. Like I say, I... What about the cutting? Is, is there a difference you can note in cutting and, and the styling? Um, I know my opinion, but what would be your opinion be? Uh, probably the same. It's So their fades are unbelievable. Um, I've seen people fade out there that ain't even known for, for anything. And it looks like it's airbrushed. It's absolutely awesome. But you look at the top of it, and it's having a party of some sort because mm. they don't know what they're doing with it. So well, it's only been the last couple of years that I've been going out uh, that they now have more of an interest in what we do because we, mm. we are so different to, to them and how we cut because we're the full package. So although our fades might not be as airbrushy looked as, as theirs sometimes, um, the whole style and the whole concept of what we do is a full package, whereas they can't get that balance yet. So, and that's not everyone. I'm not, I'm not saying that, you know, they can't cut hair. They can cut hair. Um, and they're very good, but it's a lot. I, I think it's a lot to do with the fusion that we've had over the over the years of hairdressing and barbering. So we we concentrate as much on the top and our styling, um, whereas they haven't been used to that. They've been used to like just take off a bit of length and use a wet product, and it will look alright. Whereas we're about texture and softness and, and structure and shape and stuff like that. And again, the hair textures as well, because a lot of the barbs that we do over there that do like this and the cam and stuff, it's all these very strong hairlines because they have such low growing hairlines, don't they? Whereas we're working a lot of times on, on hair that mine was, I would say is now, uh, and yours, where we can create the texture and the, using yeah. uh, matte paste, things like that, you know? When I first went over there, maybe five years ago, six years ago, um, and I was using dry products then, you know, um, and I yeah. was using a lot of powder and stuff like that. And they were like, what? And I was like, yeah, look, well, I'll do a pop on stage 
But I'm going to do it dry with a little bit of separation of movement, you know. Um, and they'd be like, whoa, what's that about? Because they're used to using like a pomade on it straight away. And whereas we were like already starting to soften everything up, even like, you know, pompadours and stuff like that. So there, there is a huge difference. But now they've, they've sort of taken that on board. And, and they want to yes. learn that. You know, a, a, so there's a lot of new ones coming through. I mean, people like John Carmona, Titan Barber, who's worked with us, and there's a guy, Taylor Fade. And there's a lot of these guys that are, um, they're actually, they say it quite openly, they're adopting this European or this London look or whatever they want to call it. Um, yeah. And that's interesting. It's good to know that both sort of industries can bounce off one another. What about the Russian barbers? Because again, I see them as being slightly different. Again, I see this. Clipper Killer is a good friend of ours who's been to two shows. Uh, and there's a couple of other fantastic, the imagery is fantastic, they used on Instagram. How do you feel they differ? Again, I think they're a little bit further behind us um, in the sense of maybe I would go two, two three years maybe behind. Um, certain people are starting to stand, like stand out. For instance, like you say, uh, you know, Roman, he, he stands out a lot because he has his own uh, style. He, you know, for, for someone like Roman, he's probably taken a bit of influence from Josh, uh, Joshua Monica and people like that because it's that sort of structure uh, to his styles. His imagery is absolutely fantastic in what he does with his camera work and stuff. Um, but when you see a lot of basic Russian barbers, they, they're technically good, but they don't have that. They don't know how to be creative. Um, right. so the more, of, still, more of a fundamental kind of in and out barber like we used to see a lot. Yeah, so they still cut hair to the the head shape, if you like. So they'll follow round on your on your head like that. Mm. Whereas we put in something square if it's more masculine and, and stuff. They, they tend to just have the way they've learned, so they just follow the, the head shape. Um, but, they're, you know, they're coming into their own. There's quite a few good outstanding barbers out there now that, you know, you want to watch and go, oh, my God, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, but like I say, they're, they're just a, a few years behind where we were. Yeah, and again, they come over to over here quite a lot and we're starting to see, I mean, we had a guy um, who came over to our last show in London who was fantastic. And again, they are great to follow on Instagram. They do have a different flavour, the prolific ones. Um, we're going to finish in a few minutes, but give me a couple of names of people that impressed you or inspired you over your career. Um, who's the influence on Baldy's career since the start? Um so my biggest influence ever was my first ever boss, Donato Paselli. He probably hasn't even got social media, so he won't see this. Um, because he gave me my start. Um, and then I've, I've got to say, like initially when the explosion happened, uh, Scorum, so, uh, you know, Rob uh, and Lynn, I seemed, like Rob, I, I remember watching them at Barber Connect. Um, and just watching him do a cut. And someone come up to me and went, oh, excuse me, you're baldy, aren't you? And I was like, uh, yeah. I said, listen, can you give me a few minutes? I just want to, want to watch. Oh, uh, yeah, can I get a photo? Look, can you give me a few minutes? I, I really want to watch. And I, I felt like I was being rude, but I, I was in awe of <laughs> Rob cutting it. You know, it, it, yeah. what they did, the classic styles and stuff like that. I was like, oh, my God, it's unbelievable. So that was a massive influence for when I was first doing, like, scumbags and stuff like that. Um, and then from there, massive influences are Alan's always been an influence because uh, I love him. Yeah. Um, Josh with Monica, just because he was the first person really to start working with head shapes. Not so much. I'm, I'm not a massive fan of, of sectioning, right? <laughs> because I think you can still achieve whatever and i've done that on your stage i've explained this you know you, you can still put the same structure into a haircut where, without having to put like 200 sections in um you know so but sometimes you feel it can maybe be a little bit over elaborate for being elaborate sake almost you know i get that um but Josh LaMonica purely because and i know josh you know and we, and we talk and what have you 
Um, but just for the creative stuff that he's he's brought forward, and and that's been a massive thing for people. Um, and I don't think people understand it fully. You know, they they go, oh yeah, Joshua Monica. Uh, yeah, but for what he's done for this industry, you know, with head shape and and just going, you know what? Why can't I take that section out? You know, yeah, why can't you? Um, so him. Uh, Someone who I love to bits is Josh OP. Um, yes. He's not everyone's cup of tea, but I think the concept cutting, uh, absolutely phenomenal. I, you know, I judged him at, at one of your shows a few years back when he first started, and he was like pretty much self-taught, had a little signature of his own, uh, and I, I really took to him. Uh, he smashed it. He's smashing it all over the place, isn't he? Now he's he's so busy. He's just opening his own academy uh, online and, and all this. He's got an education team now, but for for everything that he does, I look at that and I'm like, oh my god, that's amazing. Do you know what I mean? He's, yeah, he's phenomenal. And, and good luck to him. I love him to bits, and, and I wish you know the world for him. Um, so. People like that, people on my Andy's team, I adore, and I think that if, if I didn't like them, then I wouldn't have them, uh, regardless of what they think. Uh, <laughs> but they're all really talented. Hayden, especially. Um, you know, I've got Jared. They're, they're a phenomenal team. Kev Worley, um, Lindy. You know, we've, we've got a great team. Um, it works really well. People like Liam. Uh, coming through. Liam, I look at his work and I work alongside him a lot of the time. And I'm like, oh my God, how do you do that? Um, and he does those soft, airbrushy looking fades. And I'm like, oh my God. Yeah. So, you know, there's, there's lots of people that, that I admire. And if there's people out there that I, I forgot or haven't mentioned, then it doesn't mean that I don't admire you. I do. I admire so many people. And, and you'll know this because. I'm one of those people that will stand in the crowd and watch, you know? Um, and if someone does come up me... I think that's important, what you're saying, that showing each other appreciation and also respecting one another in the industry. I think that's a massive thing that we've hopefully developed over the last five years when we tried to create this more of a community spirit, you know? The thing is, I've made so many friends. It's unbelievable. Um, and people like... It's weird. You you get certain groups of people that you fit into. And although I do the education and I'll, I'll talk to whoever's standing there, whether they're from the hair council or whoever, you know, sitting girls, men's hair bed, I, I talk to everyone. But my my core group I fit into look like this, right? So I, I'll knock about with like Colin, Luca, uh, Matt Robinson, uh, Frank, um, you know, people like that. That that's my group, and like Paul Hewitt um, and and Nick, people like that. I I do all the pop up stuff. That that was my first start was pop ups. You know, yeah. and we all look the same, and we stand there beside each other, cutting air, chatting nonsense, and that I still love. That's my core. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, well, it's great. I mean, as I say, it's like any me as well. Tr being able to travel all across the UK and beyond, and I think we can got friends in every city. There's somebody I can call in any city you go to. Yeah. That's part of what we've tried to build with the Barb Bash is the community. Um, and again, it's all that positivity. You know, I know it sounds a bit cliche, but creating a good vibe with each other supporting each other saying well done and you know, like you're saying you go and watch people cutting hair and stuff and hopefully give positive input one thing i was going to ask you i think i've got two questions left just to do the andis thing give me three andis tools that you that are your go-to can't live without andis tools uh can't live without oh hello someone's come up from the screen um things i can't live without are um my slimline pro li uh yes still got, still got one that i've had five years um really? i have two of those can i have an extra one because i have two um, on. and then my master cordless yes the new master cordless the silver big lump which is beautiful i enjoy it go for anything 
Um, failing that, if I didn't have that, then I'd go with the uh, US Pro cordless with a fade blade on. Um, yeah, I use that every day, and that that's pretty much it. I can get away with that, I reckon. Brilliant. Thank you for that. One question before I get you to do your little roundup is, where's the next five years going to be? How do you see Baldi's empire or Baldi's education? Where, where are you going to be? Where can we see you? And what do you think is going to happen with the industry in the next five years? Um, God knows. Uh, do you know what? I'm sort of getting back in touch with my roots a little bit. So I'm doing a few... Uh, tattoo conventions again uh, with Paul Hewitt and stuff right. um, and the thing from them um, so I've sort of got back into that side of enjoyment obviously I'll still be around the world with Andis um, leading the European team hopefully and the thing for me it's hard because I'm getting older so I have a little bit of a shelf life I'm guessing you know what I mean? Yeah, it's that, it's that metal hips when you go through this metal detector, isn't it? Your hip replacements, your knee replacements. Yeah, everything starts beeping. Um, but it, it, That's your cock ring. Yeah. I, <laughs> That's I, your Prince Albert, come on. I have to look at um, uh, the longevity of my career, if you like. So hence why I became UK lead, then European lead. Um, you know, and this... Uh, are obviously a, a family-run business still. You know, uh, they're like third, third, fourth generation Matt and Andis. Um, and what I've found with them is, as long as I'm bringing something, I'm still part of that family. So even if I'm not going to be up there on stage presenting in five years' time, I'll be stood at the side of that stage. Um, comparing or running that team um that that's ideally that's what i want to be doing still you know i still want to have that input i've managed to get that team looking better and better and better and getting better and better over the last five years and i want to still progress that um and then mm. and still run my shops you know i still love standing on the shop floor cutting air every day beside you know uh tom and, and liam um you know i've got a great team so you know, if I retire when I'm 82 um, in four years' time, then so be it. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, listen, you've been fantastic to, uh, to interview. Um, if people want to contact you, they can contact you on Instagram. I am actually got the Baldi's website they can go to. Um, if anybody's got any questions for us at any time, feel free to hit me up with any questions. It's been really insightful. I think you, you've really explained about the fundamentals of being an educator, how to get there, what it entails, and some tips for some new people coming through. So listen, buddy, thank you so much. I really appreciate you coming on. And I hope you don't retire anytime soon because um, you're when I'm at parties and stuff. So thanks a lot. And uh, I'll see you soon. Thank you. All right. Here's Baldy. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Gary.